welcome to Talking Geopolitics. I'm Christian Smith. On this episode, it's a year since an enormous explosion in Beirut grabbed global headlines. The explosion, seemingly caused by government incompetence and corruption, was an obvious symbol for the state of Lebanese society. Yet a year on, nothing has changed. In fact, things seem to have gotten worse. So on this episode, we sat down with our Middle East expert, Professor Halal Kashan, who lives just outside of Beirut, to understand why he despairs for Lebanon's future and what it means for regional geopolitics. But first, at the start of each year, Geopolitical Futures releases its annual forecast, setting out where it believes global geopolitics will head in the following 12 months. Now, scarily, it's August, and so with more than half the year already gone, we thought it would be as good a time as any to see if that forecast is on track. A midterm report card, so to speak. To do so, I spoke about the European forecast with Head of Analysis, Alison Federka, and the Asia-Pacific forecast with East Asia expert, Philip Orchard. Alison, I want to ask you to start off with, and, and, and this might seem like a bit of an obvious question, but how do you make a forecast? So it is a, not, not an obvious question, or at least a question that has a simple tone, but a more complicated answer. We start our forecasting process around October, sometimes uh, September or November, depending on the year. So it's, it's an in-depth process. And the first thing that we do is we need to understand the present. You can't figure out what's going to happen in the future if you don't have a good handle on what's going on here and now. So we use our model, and that basically consists of looking at a what a country needs, uh, what it can do, what it can't do. So that's what we refer to as its constraints. And then where does a country's pursuit of its needs put it into conflict with someone else? And those are kind of the three things that we evaluate to have a sense of the status quo of, of where countries are at in the present before we make a forecast. And then the other things that we do is we kind of take a picture of the global environment to understand what are the most important things happening globally. These are the things that no country can escape or that are going to touch the majority of the countries and look at them from the perspective of a major force or a major trend. So if you look at our 2021 forecast, we really highlighted the economy and the implications of economic recovery that were going to happen as a result of the 2020 pandemic. And that's the example of a global force that's in play that is really going to impact every single country that we see. Then after that is when we come to actually getting to the forecast and looking forward in terms of what's going to happen next. And the criteria for that is a few things. Um, We need to have something that is going to happen within the next 12 months or whatever time period we say that that forecast is going to be for. It needs to be some type of significant trend or shift in the political system. So it's always a temptation to say that everything's going to stay the same. What we are looking for is identifying major trends and and how they impact a country if there's any emerging trends or emerging issues that are going to start to appear in the upcoming year that we haven't seen already or that are going to have more weight, or if we are planning to see a major shift in the global system and what that shift would imply for how countries interact with each other. And then the last thing that we do is we need to make sure that we write it in such a way that it is falsifiable because you can pretty much say whatever you want. If it's not falsifiable, you, you'll you always be right. And our goal is to be very clear and discreet with our forecasts. So it doesn't sound vague. It doesn't sound like it could occur at any point in time or in any place. And then also that at the end of the year, when we do our report card, you, we will be able to say, hey, we were right here. Oh, maybe we were a little off here. Or this just, you know, we're in the middle of this process and the timing was off. But um, we do have a report card that we put out every year at the end of the year, and you can see it in the forecast section of our webpage. And basically, it it shows you most of the time we are on track, but sometimes we are a little bit off track. And the only way we can make that determination is if we have a forecast that is very clearly stated about a, a specific trend or event, 
and we can actually falsify it. Uh, and that way we know, yes, we were right or no, we were not so right. Thanks, Alison. Uh, well, let's then do a little bit of a midterm report card. Eh? We're seven months into the year and I want to come to you now, Phil, who, who, you know, you're, you're the East Asia expert, the Asia Pacific expert as well, of course. The forecast covers all, all corners of the globe, but that Asia Pacific region is, of course, one of the most interesting in the world right now and, and will be for a while. Seven months into the year, essentially halfway through, how are you seeing that forecast for that region tracking now, Phil? Broadly speaking, I'm feeling pretty good about it. You know, the big issue is is U.S. China, and I think that's going to be the big issue for a long time. Um, we argued that with the change of administration in the U.S. would not lead to any kind of substantive difference in or reduction in tensions between the two. And in fact, that the U.S. would uh, shift focus somewhat on how it goes about um, dealing with China, uh, but that the bro- the broad tenor of the relationship relationship would, if anything, worsen. And I think that's been on track. Um, we've seen the U.S. shift focus to improving ties with allies rather than trying to directly um, force China itself to change. Um, and we've also seen, for example, uh, especially in the Indo Pacific, um, another one of our forecasts was that. Um, or, you know, this ties directly into the U S relationship with, uh, the Philippines, which where we said that, um, that the, the U S has had this long, you know, or had this landmark, uh, agreement to establish a bunch of new military bases, um, that they reached, uh, four or five years ago. And, but it's been stalled under, under Duterte. And we, we said that it would remain stalled and that would force the U S to go, um, look elsewhere for places to put its troops and it's actively doing that. So I think that's like generally on track, even though today we finally had a breakthrough um, in U S Philippine ties where they uh, put this issue of a visiting forces agreement to rest. Uh, So there might be some movement there, but I don't think that's necessarily going to lead to a major movement on the basing issue. Um, I think the U.S. is trying to run out the clock on the Duterte administration and try try their hand with the next guy or, or next guy or gal in the case of Duterte's daughter, uh, who very right as of today would be the next president. Um, we've also seen the U.S. move away from tariffs as its main focus uh, for bringing China to heel. Uh, they have not rolled back to very many of the tariffs, but they've you know, stopped implementing new ones and. The, and the, they don't seem particularly uh, keen on imposing new ones, or they don't seem to think that um, they would do much good. Or that they, if anything, that they would do more harm than good to U.S. Uh, economic interests. Um, and I think we 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 were we're very much on track with how with China's behavior. Um, this we've been arguing that China would emerge from the pandemic. Uh, both at once emboldened, yet still under incredible mu- amount of stress. And that would make it more aggressive, both at home abroad, home and abroad. Uh, and that's, I think that's pretty clearly been happening in an, on a number of fronts. Um, both, you know, for example, what we're watching with them cracking down on their tech firms and, uh, p- putting more dissidents in jail, tightening their grip on Hong Kong. Uh, getting more aggressive abroad with uh, with Australia and other countries, uh, Europe as well. Um, another one I think we're I would argue that we're on track is uh, that China's aggressive approach to um, to Australia would lead would force Australia to to start taking major steps toward uh, deepening its uh, trade and export relationship with India. Um, that I think that's going to take a some time to like bear fruit, but they are absolutely uh, doing that. They're at least laying the groundwork for it with new trade talks and both countries releasing this, these grand uh, documents for uh, how, you know, proclaiming how important they are for each other um, in uh, trade and economic matters. So Phil, that's where we're, we're on track. What about where we're off? Yeah, I think the two areas where uh, inarguably we are on, um, or not yet uh, proven correct, though, they, though there's still time left in the year. Uh, one of them, we said that China would manufacture a military crisis with Taiwan. 
uh, although it would stop short of anything that would trigger an international response. Now, clearly, Ch- China's military posturing has increased. Their incursions into Taiwanese airspace and waters have increased. Things are getting really tense, but they haven't necessarily made any kind of mood that would precipitate a crisis. Uh, wh- what I really had in mind when we wrote this was something I wrote a piece last summer kind of laying this out, but something like a, an, an, a seizure of one of Taiwan's mostly empty outlying islands, just some kind of something like that, that would be low risk, allow them to back down, but would actually be a major, you know, pr- uh, provocation and something that would break the trend from uh, a su- significant escalation from the current trend. Uh, they've been doing exercises simulating that invasion, but they have not done one yet. Um, the other option would be some kind of limited blockade or something like that. Um, hasn't happened yet, and I uh, hope for Taiwan's sake it doesn't, but uh, still have a lot of time left. The other one, which is very falsifiable and discreet, is we said that um, North Korea would resume ICBM tests in order to agitate for sanctions relief from the Biden administration. Uh, that they have not launched an ICBM. Um, and in fact, I, uh, our, our logic at the time was, a, you know, a couple of things is uh, North Korea really needs to get out to f- force some kind of new negotiation with the Biden administration. It can't, it's very unhappy with the status quo. It has little reason to live with it. And the best, and the U S would be preoccupied with other matters. The best way to get its attention would be to, um, break this sort of implicit deal that they've had for a couple of years where they would, it would stop doing nuclear and ICBM tests. Um, it hasn't gotten anything in exchange for that. And also they showed off a new ICBM at a military parade last year. And whenever they show off a new ICBM, they taste, they eventually test it. Um, also in the first years of new U S presidents, one after another dating back to Clinton or before, uh, they've always welcomed them with some sort of major provocation, uh, whether IC or missile tests or nuclear tests and so forth. Um, but I think between COVID and their internal stresses and various signs of internal power struggles, North Korea has been very internally preoccupied. And, uh, you know, just recently we're starting to see signs that, you know, they may be getting back to uh, their old selves. But um, I think, uh, it's still, you know, going to be internally focused for a while. And, uh, that makes it unpredictable because I could compel it to become even more aggressive abroad. Um, but for the time being, they seem to be, uh, content with, uh, dealing with their, their problems at home. Still lots to keep watching for the rest of the year then. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Alison, let's come back to you. Um, and you, you're having a look at what the, uh, what the forecast was saying about Europe. I think in particular, um, the role of Germany within the EU and within within Europe seems to be, if not changing, then then showing signs of it. Right. Uh, so the, the forecast itself is that countries in the EU will question Germany's leadership. Member states will look to Germany to help meet their needs, but they will not be willing to make sacrifices in return. And this is one of our more interesting forecasts for Europe and also one of the more dynamic ones uh, because it's not only about one country, but how these countries are interacting and responding to each other. And it's interesting right now because when you do a forecast, it's not like they're going to be active every single day throughout the year. You will have periods of where they are more active or less active. And right now we are starting to really see a lot um, this summer of this forecast starting to develop, which is why we are keeping an eye on it and and finding it so interesting at this point in time. And what we're seeing are two things happening is, is we're seeing Germany starting to deal with some of its own internal issues. They are dealing with their own political debates inside with their upcoming elections. There's always that question of migration coming in and how are they going to handle that within the EU and with Turkey. And they also have this question of economic recovery, which we've we've covered extensively, where they need to protect their own economy, what measures will allow them to recover versus what measures will allow the rest of the EU to recover. And that puts it into conflict with, say, Italy or countries in the uh, southern part of Europe that are members of the Eurozone. And so right now what we're seeing is Germany is no longer as on solid ground as it was 
say, pre-2008 financial crisis or even afterwards, but before COVID, where it was very strongly placed as the de facto leader of the EU. They're on shaky ground and, and power and strength is relative. And so we are seeing France start to become more active. And if you look at the news and you just Google Macron, you will find that he has been to Asia. He's sending officials to the Middle East. He's courting the Italian prime minister. He's making trips to Africa. France is all over the place, and they are really trying to play a strong foreign policy, international hand, and pursue things that aren't necessarily in Germany's interest, but very much focused on what is in the French interest. And to top that off, we are now also seeing other countries like Italy partner up more with France on certain uh, economic and political initiatives that suggest that they might be looking to each other to form some type of power or political economic alternative to Germany in the EU. Uh, So not only just questioning Germany's leadership, but seeing moves to either in the case of France position itself as an alternative power or in the case of Italy to seek out other partnerships that would allow it to operate and get what it wants without having to rely on Germany. Well, Alison, thanks very much for that. Uh, And we will, of course, keep tracking that in Europe as well. I particularly like these forecasts because I think it, it kind of gives you a really good way of stepping back and seeing the big picture, but then also seeing where the big picture is going. Um, so we look forward to seeing what the report card says at the end of the year. Phil and Alison, thanks very much. Talking Geopolitics is brought to you by Geopolitical Futures, your source for geopolitical forecasting and analysis. It's a year since an enormous explosion in Beirut shocked the world. But despite the striking images, that explosion was really just the tip of the iceberg for a nation that is now experiencing a period of almost complete political and economic failure. Once called the Paris of the Middle East, Beirut now only has electricity for a few hours a day. For a nation almost fatalistically accustomed to hardship, what we now seem to be witnessing is the slow collapse of a society. To understand why this is, what it could mean, and perhaps most importantly, why no one is doing anything about it, I spoke to our Middle East expert, Professor Halal Kashan, who lives in Lebanon. Hello, thanks very much for your time. Uh, in October 2019, major protests sprang up in, in Lebanon in opposition to the WhatsApp tax. And then last year, of course, no one can forget the, the images of the explosion at the port in Beirut. Now, though, I think Lebanon has somewhat fallen off the radar of, of most people around the world. Can you just give us an update of of the state of Lebanese politics and the economy? And let's start with the Lebanese economy. What is the situation? Yes, uh, uh, the problems that started in October 2019 uh, 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 okay, ushered in the huge financial problems facing Lebanon. Immediately afterwards, the Lebanese banking sector collapsed and the banks uh Seized giving uh, people their uh, their dollar uh, deposits. You know, we the Lebanese people learned from the experience of the 1980s not to deposit uh, their savings in the local currency, but in the U.S. dollar to protect it against uh, currency devaluation. Yet the banking sector, and in collusion with the Central Bank of Lebanon, uh, preyed on people's deposits. Uh, and uh, simply the deposits expired. And we, since then, we haven't had access to our uh, life uh, savings. Now, since then, the crisis has uh, uh, become exacerbated. And uh, last year, actually, uh, two days from now, uh, we, the Lebanese people, will observe the first uh, anniversary of the huge port explosion. And that port explosion uh, uh, has been uh, an issue of contention in Lebanese politics. A year after the explosion, the government has done very little to investigate the matter and to hold anybody accountable for it. And there has been a raging debate in the country over whether the uh, prosecutor uh, general should investigate uh, members of the parliament and uh, top security officials 
but the parliament voted against uh, uh, removing uh, their uh, immunity. And the same thing went uh, applied for security officers and for uh, army, uh, retired army generals. So the matter has not been properly investigated. The previous uh, investigator was dismissed because he wanted to uh, I mean, because he wanted to interrogate the officials. And the new one also wants to do the same, but he has been facing uh, insurmountable problems as far as investigating the issue. What happened uh, during the course of the past year was the total collapse of uh, the Lebanese political system. The government does not function. Uh, uh, The central bank does not have funds to uh, to cover the cost of fuel, electricity, and uh, Lebanon last year uh, uh, stopped servicing its debt and it defaulted on its debt, and the financial situation reached uh, uh, an unprecedented level of uh, uh, of uh, uh, decline and loss of value. Before the beginning of the crisis in, la- in October 2019, the rate of, ex- of exchange for the US dollar was 1,500 Lebanese pounds. Now the rate of exchange is 21,000 pounds for the dollar. And the rate of inflation in Lebanon during the past 18 months has been 1,200%. And I mean, what's the state of, of, of public services, electricity, the internet, that sort of thing? You know, uh, ever since I was born, Lebanon has been having serious electric electricity supplies. Uh, generation capacity has inc- has not increased over the years, despite the tripling of the population. And in the recent years, because of lack of funds and uh, inability to uh, to maintain uh, the grid, uh, the government uh, has been uh, providing electricity on maybe 12 hours per day uh, during normal uh, uh, weather conditions. But in the summer, uh, usually the government provides electricity on a six-hour basis. Now uh, the government is not providing any electricity at all. So uh, people uh, years ago started to subscribe to uh, to private power generators. But again, because of the severe uh, energy crisis in Lebanon, even those private uh, providers are no longer providing electricity except maybe for a couple of hours a day. So the, uh, the energy situation is uh, grim. And it is difficult to buy food from supermarkets. Uh, leave alone the high cost, the higher level of inflation. One cannot trust uh, 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 getting meat or poultry or uh, cheeses, dairy products from uh, supermarkets because they don't have electricity. So the, the I mean, the living conditions of the Lebanese people have deteriorated rapidly during the past eighteen months. And you, you wrote an article recently for for Geopolitical Futures last well, it's August now, I beg your pardon. So so in June about about the the political structure of Lebanon, the sectarian nature of that structure, which is quite a unique structure, of course. And, and, and you said that, that this is part of the reason why you think, you know, things are unlikely to change. Can you just explain that a bit, Hillel? Sure. You know, uh, in 1943, uh, France granted Lebanon its uh, independence. And the founding fathers of Lebanon back then who charted the contours of the Lebanese political system were mainly business people. So they created a business corporation and they removed many of the prerogatives that normally belong to the state and they uh, delegated them to the sects. Now, this made the major sects in Lebanon uh, untouchable and uh, unapproachable. And uh, any politician or even any bureaucrat could commit any violation of the law, any crime, and seek shelter in, seek shelter and sanctuary in the sect. The Lebanese sects since 1943 have become red lines that the legal system cannot cross. That's why uh, uh, 
violations of the law, crimes, assassinations, uh, uh, embezzlement of funds go unreported in Lebanon. And whenever they are reported, the investigation gets bogged down. Eventually, this political system, which is uh, confessional in nature, whereby each uh, sect has a slice of the political pie, uh, has become unable to has not had become unable to function, especially in recent years. And uh, to tell you the truth, since the 2006 uh, Israel Hezbollah summer war, in that year Hezbollah and uh, the free patriotic uh, trend of uh, the president Michel Aoun established an alliance, and Hezbollah has become the custodian of the Lebanese political system. And this alliance between the president and Hezbollah made it impossible for other political factions to have any input into the operations of the Lebanese political system. You know, one of the things that really strikes me about this is, is, as we have talked about previously, in a situation like that where you've got limited, if not no electricity, no fuel, people's savings are gone, it's hard to buy food in the supermarkets. I imagine there's issues around, well, there are issues around COVID-19 as well, of course. It, it's amazing to, to think what at what point is too much for the Lebanese people to put up with it? At what point do they take to the streets and, and retake control from this political class that's clearly failed? Well, I, I hate to say it, uh, uh, the Lebanese people, and I am one of them, are politically incompetent. Uh, you, you know, people realize that given the confessional nature of the political system, nothing they do will have any impact on the operations of the politicians. The politicians operate in a club. They have their own club. Whatever whatever happens outside the club makes no difference to them. There have been numerous demonstrations uh, now, every time, every now and then, the people protest against uh, lack of electricity, lack of uh, 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 of utilities. Even there are water shortages, and what they do, people, uh, I mean, uh, uh, set uh, tires on fire, and they know that uh, setting tires on fire is uh, is hazardous. Uh, I mean, it is uh, cancer causing, and they know that. Uh, uh, their action would not impress the ruling elite. And they even set uh, garbage uh, uh, dumpsters on, on fire. And they know that no matter what they do, nothing will happen. But they keep repeating their action. They block uh, access to the highways. They they block access to, uh, to inner city roads. But that's it. They keep repeating the same things, you know. Uh, given the magnitude of the problem uh, in Lebanon, The ruling elite, as divided as they are, they are assured that they can take their time to resolve the crises of facing the country, if at all possible. And they know that the people will not uh, uh, tamper with their uh, their political bickering and uh, political uh, functions. So the people are removed from the political system. You know, uh, the Lebanese political system is structured along pattern client uh, uh, bases whereby local politicians provide for the well-being of the people. Uh, the state does not provide directly for uh, the people. So government projects uh, uh, affect people via their representatives who are of uh, sectarian uh, characteristics. So uh, the people are tied to their sectarian leaders, not to the state. So when they revolt against the state, there is nobody to answer them because the state does not establish contact with the people and nobody dares to question the legitimacy of their sectarian leaders because people understand or know what uh, know that if they... Uh, burn bridges with their uh, sectarian leaders, they will have nobody else to uh, resort to. Let's look briefly at, at, at the wider regional geopolitics of this. Uh, as you said before, uh, Hezbollah is, is, is largely in, in control in one way or the other of, of the country, and, and obviously Hezbollah is tied closely to Iran. What What is the regional, what, what are the consequences of, of a kind of failed Lebanon in the Middle East? Well, Lebanon has already, is already a failed state, you know, but, you know, uh, 
Uh, let's be honest, you know, uh, the failure of the Lebanese political system does not affect the region. Lebanon is not a pivotal state. It is not a central state, you know. Uh, it's not Saudi Arabia. It is uh, It is not Egypt. Uh, it is not uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, so um, uh, whatever happens in Lebanon does not seem to have an impact on the, uh, on the regional balance uh, of power. Uh, having said that, I think uh, one of the issues uh, that have been delaying the Vienna talks between uh, between the five uh, uh, members of the Security Council and uh, Iran uh, is not really the central issue, in my opinion, is not Iran's nuclear program. It is the central issues are Iran's nu- missile uh, program and regional proxies. Uh, the and the most important regional proxy for Iran is uh, Hezbollah. Now, uh, the nuclear power will not uh, give Iran anything more than prestige, but uh, their missile program deters their perceived enemies, and their proxies have allowed Iran to become a major regional power. So, uh, uh, for for Iran, uh, the maintenance of its contacts with its uh, uh, regional proxies is far more important than the nuclear program. And this is the problem. I don't understand to what extent will uh, the U.S. and uh, its allies apply pressure on Iran to sway her to uh, to, dis- to dissociate its foreign policy from its proxies. This is the challenge. And as far as I can see it, I don't think it is happening. Lebanon, of course, has, has a strong history with, with Western countries and the British and, and the French. And, uh, and, you know, last year after the explosion in Beirut, we saw Macron flying out there pretty quickly. Is that w- w- combined with that with, with the influence of Iran and Hezbollah, is there a risk then that, that Lebanon is just going to become a battleground either symbolically or or hopefully not literally, for an Iran-Western proxy battle? Uh, I don't think so. You know, the the French do not have, do not wield influence in Lebanon. Uh, The French approach to Lebanon amounts to a vocal phenomenon. Uh, Macron came twice to Lebanon. He made the promises to counter the Lebanese uh, uh, lethargic political elite. He keep prodding them to do something to salvage their country to no avail. Uh, uh, France is not an international power, I, I don't, no matter what they say. You know, uh, and the only country that can face uh, Iran in Lebanon is the U.S. But the question is, the U.S. policymakers don't feel that Lebanon is sufficiently important to uh, to use it as a staging ground against Iran, they use diplomacy. But I don't see Lebanon becoming a a, a hot uh, arena of regional contestation because the Iranians have already taken it over via Hezbollah. Hello, Al Kashan. Thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure, as always. That's all for this episode of Talking Geopolitics. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, you take care and goodbye. You've been listening to Talking Geopolitics from the team at Geopolitical Futures. If you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe to Talking Geopolitics wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear your comments and questions. Go to geopoliticalfutures.com forward slash podcast to leave your feedback. That's geopoliticalfutures.com forward slash podcast.